Hello, what an honor to be here. I'm Keith Smith. I'm an anesthesiologist, um, private practice in Oklahoma City and co-founder of Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which many of you probably have never heard of, and also co-founder with Jay Kempton of the uh, Free Market Medical Association, an association that that is formed because facilities like mine have made so much sense to the buyers of healthcare, whether they're individuals or self-funded companies, that they're sprouting up all over the country. Uh, and uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about our experience, uh, what it's meant for us, and why everybody in this room is so critical, perhaps even more critical than any of the any of the efforts that facilities like mine uh, have made, much more critical really than anything we've done. Surgery Center of Oklahoma has been open uh, 20 years this May. Uh, we're different uh, in that we are real, we're real serious advocates of the free market. Um, we've been like that since the day we opened, but we're much more like that now than we were uh, when we opened. We decided when we opened we would never take a dime of money from the government. We treat Medicare patients, sometimes free, sometimes they pay our website fees, but we do not accept any money from the government, never have, never plan to. We also decided in 1997 when we opened to be honest and open with patients about what things cost. We had seen in the early 90s the price of health care in the uh, hospitals go through the roof, watch the administrative staffs become even more bloated, uh, the nursing staffs on the floor dwindle, and the quality of the care in the hospitals dwindle. As an anesthesiologist, I was forced to work with surgeons that I would uh, characterize as incompetent, unethical, or both. Uh, I didn't have really much much control over that when I was on call about who I was working with. And Stephen Lantier, another anesthesiologist, he and I decided that you know, we didn't want to be uh, accomplices. You know, we didn't want to be an accessory to a crime. And that's really how we felt. So we opened the Surgery Center of Oklahoma and the first week we were open, we started getting calls from people who, individuals who did not have insurance, who wanted to know how much is my breast biopsy going to cost there? Well, I'd, I didn't know that I was supposed to wrench as much money out of them as possible. So I called the surgeon and said, how much do you want? He had no idea, no clue, because even by 1997, even though uh, resource-based relative value scale, which I refer to as the Rosemary's baby of Harvard University, um, RBRVS had not been around that long, but it did not take very long for physicians to get mashed out of them the idea that I determine what I do and what it's worth. The surgeons by 1997 didn't even know. I mean, they just had no clue. So the surgeon for a breast biopsy finally, after I badgered him, it said, I mean, do you want me to decide what you're going to get paid? You know, $500. I thought, well, that's pretty darn cheap. Okay. So running the surgery center, by the way, we don't have an administrator at our facility. You're looking at him. So um, <laughs> we don't need one. So I knew about how long that procedure would take. I knew what the supply costs were. They're actually minimal. And as an anesthesiologist, not to berate my profession, but we bill for our time. I mean, and we kind of all do, but we basically bill for our time and we know how long these procedures are gonna take. So before I took this lady off hold, I mean, she's on hold while I'm thinking through this, <laughs> I thought, you know, she's asking what is this gonna cost? And this is a breast mass, there's gonna be a pathologist involved. So I called my friend, a pathologist, and said, how much do you want to examine and diagnose this very likely benign breast mass? I don't know. <laughs> Come on, this lady's on hold, you know. So um, $85. So I added it all up and took the lady off hold. This whole thing took about five minutes because I had one of my associates make one of the calls for me. $1,900 bundled all in and she said that's interesting the not-for-profit hospital 
down the road wanted 19,000 and that was just for the facility. So we knew we were on to something and thought, man, these uninsured people, this is cool. You know, they'll pay us up front and we get to decide what we're worth and how fun is this? So time went on and more and more of the uninsured found us. And then I'd get a call from one of my uh, business office people and said, well, we have a patient on the phone that needs a hernia repair and how much is that? I said, my God, I've quoted that before. Why aren't you writing these things down? <laughs> so, so this list, this list materialized for all of these surgeries for which we were quoting pricing. Well, we weren't very popular, as you can imagine, with the hospitals in town, particularly the so-called not-for-profit hospitals that I say have to charge 10 times what we do to not make a profit. And so they be the retaliation began, and the hospitals began retaliating uh, in concert with the carriers and with the insurance companies who manipulated deductibles and out-of-network deductibles and how they cross-supply in a way that made entry into our facility financially unfeasible for many people. Because, <laughs> surprise, we were out of network with everyone. I mean, no insurance carrier would deal with us. We didn't understand that until much later. So we just about died. I mean, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma in 2003, 2004, almost died. And we thought, golly, you know, we're these free market guys. We know we're cheaper. I mean, we were treating all of the Division I athletes in the state of Oklahoma at our facility, the Oklahoma City Thunder players now. I mean, it's the quality of this facility, it's not a question. I'm a pediatric and cardiac fellowship trained anesthesiologist, and I had anesthetized all of the children of anybody who was it kind of a decision maker in the Oklahoma City area through the years. I thought, you know, quality-wise, we've got it. Price-wise, we know we've got it. The free market's not working here, and, and we're dying. I mean, people are not coming to our facility. This doesn't make any sense. Cheaper and better, we ought to have a line out the door. So on the brink of death, we decided to double down. And I had this thought, I need to call my friends in the self-funded industry these are companies that um, these are companies that tell Blue Cross to take a hike, and they take the risk themselves, paying for their employees' health care out of operational revenue. So they actually have the sticker shock. They actually care what things cost. And by that time, we were so razor thin with our budget, even with 31 employees, we were self-funded. So I was writing checks for my employees' health care rather than paying Blue Cross 20,000 a month. So. I understood how it worked, and I thought, I need to call my friends who run these huge companies and say, how much are you paying for a gallbladder surgery? How much are you paying for tonsillectomies? I'll beat it. And then I thought, no, I need to tell them what we'll do it for. And then on a long walk one morning, my wife said, why don't you just tell everybody? So we launched a website and put our prices online. Uh, the effects of which have been very interesting. It's accomplished everything we hoped it would and more. It started a price war in Oklahoma City and elsewhere. Uh, patients from all over the country now print out our prices and walk into the hospital and say, match this or I'm flying to Oklahoma City. And you can imagine the effect that has on <laughs> surgery pricing. It's also helped us understand and uncover the scam of healthcare finance in the United States, something that I've talked about and written about, and no doubt at some risk to myself. Um, but the scams of healthcare, uh, and, and before we get, we're too hard on the hospitals and insurance companies, keep in mind from whom they're buying all these favors, and it's Washington, D.C. I mean, if you really want to go to the heart of the beast in healthcare, it's D.C., because that's where all of these crony favors are auctioned. The other thing that's happened is people are copying us. And Jay and I are helping people copy us because this is beautiful. I mean, there's plenty of business out there for the good guys. I mean, I, I know who my competitors are and they're not my enemies. I mean, my enemies are the price gougers and they're everybody's enemies. So things started to go pretty well with this website, but it, we didn't really glow hot on the radar 
until Jay and I met. So I have a friend who owns a company that's self-funded who is a client of Jay Kempton's. And Jay heard about me, long story, said, will you extend this pricing you have on your website to my clients? I said, yes, here's the self-funded company connection I've been looking for. And to Jay's credit, he didn't keep me a secret from his competitors. He actually made sure I had speaking slots at national trade associations where rooms much bigger than this heard this message. And his competitors knew the Surgery Center of Oklahoma and our pricing was available to them as well. So this, this self-funded industry is something that Jay understands much better than I do. And I would encourage you as you listen to Jay's remarks to keep in mind there is no way on earth everybody in this room could satisfy 1% of the demand in your area from the self-funded community. And they are such a large purchaser of health care, cash purchaser of health care for the benefit of their employees. It can't help but mash prices down as competition does. I mean, competition makes us all better. Prices will fall. And everybody in the room knows physician compensation has been flat for a long time. It's these price gouging facilities that are, that are making all the money despite all their poor mouthing. So I want to tease you a little bit to keep an open mind as you hear about how does the self-funded industry work. The Surgery Center of Oklahoma would be closed if it were not for the self-funded industry and Jay Kempton, my friend in particular. So thank you. And I, we're having questions, I guess, on the panel. And I think that's the end of my time. So I'm really honored to be here. Thank you all for having me. Thank y'all for, for having me. I'm Jay Kempton. Uh, and as when Keith and I get to speak together at these events, uh, we, we kind of step on each other's presentations uh, to some degree, but that's, that's okay. Um, I have a couple of different roles that I play. One of them is, is uh, um, Dr. Smith had mentioned, I'm co-founder of the Free Market Medical Association, along with Dr. Smith and the Free Market Medical Association, I hope you all um, have some awareness. Uh, if not, I'm gonna have some contact information at the uh, end of my remarks, end of my slides presentation. Uh, but really in a nutshell, the Free Market Medical Association was formed uh, in order to pour a little bit of gasoline on what um, Keith and I uh, started in our relationship from a business perspective. Um, as a third party administrator, an independent third party administrator, and I'll tell you what that means here in a minute, um, I represented a lot of buyers. Uh, a self-funded employer is the ultimate, um, uh, is a pure buyer of healthcare goods and services. There's a lot of times some cost share between their employees and, and the employer's plan, but uh, really 100% of those dollars that are flowing into the healthcare system are coming from that employer. So I represented the buyer, he was a seller, and uh, I also am a facilitator. Uh, we, we kind of figured that out. I'm, I'm not actually a buyer, I represent the buyer. Uh, but in the Free Market Medical Association, the three parties that we really focus on are the pure, the buyers of healthcare goods and services, the sellers of healthcare goods and services, and then the facilitators. We also invite facilitators to be in our association. And what we try to educate these three entities on is how healthcare can work when it is simpler, flatter, more efficient, and mutually responsive between the buyer and the seller. Um, the facilitators, which I already admitted I am one, we're the ones you've got to keep your eye on um, because we tend to overstep our bounds and sometimes we also like to um, make the seller think that we're the buyer which we're really not, we should be a pass through. So with that, um, so a little bit of, a uh, little bit of nomenclature here, self-insured or self-funding is really uh, the same thing. And any time that you hear the, the word self-funding or self-insurance, I want you to think that it really means partial self-insurance. In other words, the employer is really on the risk as Dr. Smith, Dr. Smith said, but generally speaking, unless the employer gets well over, say, 1,000 employees, they're going to buy a reinsurance policy to help protect them from the really outlier claims. 
But again, uh, the employer is the buyer. The, the incidence of, 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 of uh, reinsurance providing a cap for uh, catastrophic losses, that's really kind of incidental to the medical community. But the employers take on the risk of their employees' claims expenses. Something else that a lot of y'all probably aren't aware of is that over 60% of all employees, all covered individuals that are on private health plans here in America, over 60% of them actually get those benefits through a self-insured vehicle. And Dr. Smith actually mentioned that, you know, you, everybody in the room, you, you just could not, could not hope to satisfy all of the demand from self-insurance. So if over 60% of all employee benefits are provided through self-insurance, then why is it more, more of a household name? Or a high, uh, why is that concept kind of foreign to most people? I'm gonna tell you why here in a minute. A self-funded plan is sponsored by the employer. They are the fiduciary and owner of the health plan. The employer is the fiduciary. They have a fiduciary obligation to run their self-funded health plan for the exclusive benefit of their patients. That's probably something you all also have not heard of out there. Um, most of the time, they're going to pay those claims right out of their uh, out of their manage, out of their uh, operating budget. It's uh, I try to explain to healthcare providers sometimes when I talk about a self-funded employer. Um, should be eligible for the cash discount. If we're working with a hospital, they say, well, we'll give a cash discount to patients, but we won't give it to the self-funded health plan. And sometimes you, you get kind of frustrated when you explain this to them, but you know, the dollars that Susie, patient, has that you're asking, you're gonna give Susie a cash discount, well, that cash, that came from that employer. It's just going through Susie's pocket, but it's all coming from the employer. So if you will give Susie a discount, but not the employer, you're being a little hypocritical. But 100% of those claims are funded by the employer and or the employee. Again, there's sometimes a cost sharing relationship between the employer and the employee. Now, on the previous slide, I've talked about buyers and sellers. Uh, to that point, I haven't talked about TPAs. That's because TPAs or a third party administrator like my company, um, we're optional. We really are. And I think that the medical community needs to understand that. And, and actually some of, uh, some of those employers need to understand that. Hiring a third party administrator to become the interface between the employer's benefit plan and the medical community is optional. Some of the larger employers, like we're here in, in DFW and, and I'm from Oklahoma, so I'm gonna throw out Quick Trip. Anybody, everybody's heard of QT, Quick Trip, big, you know, big employer, convenience store chain. They have about 9,000 employees. Well, they've been self-insured for decades and they've been self-administered as well. They've never hired a TPA. So when the medical community is working with Quick Trip's employees or Quick Trip's plan, they're working just with Quick Trip. Smaller employers, though, do need to buy need to, to hire a third party administration company to help them manage their plan. Now, I've I've spoke to a few different uh, medical provider groups before, and as I start going through this, I see kind of these looks in the audience. Um, I was at, actually, Lee, uh, you heard the first time I gave some of this speech down in Louisiana, and I thought I was going to, everybody was going to be high-fiving me when uh, I was going to get all these nods of knowingly nods, everybody, you know, boy, that guy really is smart, I like him, and I got, I was getting daggers from the audience, and this is a bunch of physicians out there, and I couldn't understand it, you know, th those lights were getting really bright, and I was sweating, and it was bad. But what I discovered, uh, and I should have, should have thought of this, is to the medical community, you all don't see self-funded employers very often. And there's a reason for that. Even though more than 60% of the patients you see that are not on a public plan are probably self-insured, the reason is because there's different types of third-party administrators. One of them is an independent third-party administrator, which is my company, the Kempton Group. We are an independent third-party administrator. I tell people we work for, we're only beholden to one entity, and that is our employer, uh, or excuse me, our employers that we do business with, our clients. 
Uh, we don't have a relationship with an insurance company or we're not owned by an insurance company. We don't, work, we don't have our own PPO network or anything else. So we were kind of the, the pure TPA, work exclusively for the self-funded employer. Then there's also an ASO agreement. Has anybody heard the term ASO? Ever wondered what that meant? It stands for administrative services only, and what an oxymoron that is, because Blue Cross, Aetna, Cigna, um, United, those folks are also, those insurance companies have gotten into the third party administration business. And they call those types of arrangements in ASO or administrative services only. What they're really trying to say there is well, we're not taking the risk, the employer's taking the risk, and we're only providing administrative services. That's kind of a joke because as you all in the medical community know, they do a lot more than just pay the claims. They leave a pretty heavy imprint on your daily lives as far as pre-certification, you know, all of the bureaucracy. In fact, I would guess that if you saw a patient that was with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas that was an insured patient, so in other words, they have insurance, regular traditional insurance with Blue Cross, and then the very next patient you saw was a patient that had that was self with was from a self-insured employer, but they were using Blue Cross and Blue Shield as their TPA. From your business office's perspective, and from your as a physician, those two patients look exactly the same. It's still the same shove down discount, you know, fee schedule. It, I mean, it looks exactly the same, and so you don't recognize that employee as a member of a self-funded plan. You just look at them as another Blue Cross and Blue Shield, another BUCA um, uh, patient. So that's why I think there's so much confusion out there in the medical community that when we talk about self-insurance as being the savior of the independent physician, um, I don't see an immediate recognition that I'm telling the truth. Um, then there's also some hybrids out there. Hybrids are uh, a TPA that utilizes the network, the PPO network of a carrier. I have had carriers come to me and say, hey, Mr. Kempton, we can give your employers much, much better discounts than you can get on your own if you would utilize our network arrangements through Cigna or Blue Cross. I've always told them, told them no, because the agreement that they have me sign takes essentially all of the ownership and the discretionary authority to run the plan as the employer sees fit to run their plan for the benefit of their employees. It takes that away and gives it to Cigna through their payer agreement. Um, there's another agreement in a, network, um, uh, in a network arrangement that the medical community signs. That's a provider agreement. Um, the provider agreement that a, 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 a hospital or a doctor signs with a network um, is just between you and the network. The payer agreement that I sign or my employer signs between themselves and the network, those two agreements are separate and you don't know the terms of our agreement and we don't know the terms of your agreement, but the network knows the terms of all of the agreement. They, they know both sides of it. We have kind of a wall between us. Okay, so the bottom line is the type of TPA changes the interaction with the independent physician. If an, I already kind of said this, but if an insurance carrier is the TPA or owns the PPO network, the employer will have little to no control over the plan and will be difficult for them to work directly with you. Dr. Smith, you lived that for a lot of years out there. He had friends that he knew of that were self-insured, but their TPA was Blue Cross. And when he tried to have a direct buyer-seller relationship with that employer, there was this wall there. And that wall was the carrier network. I say all that to remind you all in the audience that um, We've been doing this for almost 50 years. I'm second generation um, ownership at, at uh, our third party administration company. 
And I would say 99% of the employers that we have ever dealt with in over the 50 years, they really only have one goal as a, an employer, and that is to have happy and healthy employees that show up to work on time with a good attitude. And if we can show them a way to get that accomplished for the, for the lowest possible cost, they're in. Whether that means doing a direct relationship with the medical community or going through a PPO network, uh, they just want happy and healthy employees. So they are not beholden to uh, or required necessarily to utilize the services of a PPO discount type of arrangement. And I'm gonna have to kind of step on the gas here because I think I have a feeling I'm starting to go long. But um, the, the problem is these PPO networks, they really help no one but themselves. Um, you know, there was the, the concept of PPO networks back 20 years ago where they were going to limit a patient's choice between instead of maybe you have a choice of six hospitals, you have the choice now of three hospitals, and these three hospitals will give you a better deal than they have given you in the past because they're seeing new patients, driving volume. You flash forward to today, in any given community, almost every hospital is a member of every network. So you would think that the incentivization to give a discount off of a good starting point would go away. And if you thought that, you would be right because there is no reason to give a fair price through a network discount, yet the discounts prevail. Discounts are everywhere, in fact, in my world, most insurance consultants or insurance brokers, they will, um, part of their sales pitch to a self-funded employer is use this network instead of this network because they give you better discounts. Um, is there a way to go backwards on the slides? Ah, uh -huh, great, I'm gonna bounce real quick to this, just to make my point about discounts don't work and then I'll back up one. These are some actual claims, that actual big claims. Thankfully, we don't have these all the time. But these are some actual situations that have occurred here in the last quarter um, at my TPA. These are three scenarios. It might be a little bit small for the folks in the back, but the, the very first set there is coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, we did bundle that, uh, that claim, so that is an all-in, all-done number there. Um, the build charges for that were, I think that's $390,000 for a coronary artery bypass. I think that was actually here in Texas. After the PPO discount, whew, thank goodness we had the discount, um, they got it down to $253,000, all in, all done. That sounds like a great deal. Almost a 40% discount off of billed charges, but the PPO network, they don't care what the bill is. All, it's all about the discount. What's the amount off the billed charge? There, however, there is a free market price or a cash price from a physician-owned heart hospital in Oklahoma City called Oklahoma Heart Hospital, and their all-in, all-done cash price for the same procedure is 50000 so when you look at things like that, um, you can kind of see where actually I, I, I had a hospital CEO uh, actually in Pennsylvania, so I'm not going to rat anybody out here local, but we were talking about PPOs one night at dinner, and this, was, this guy is, uh, he's trying to come on, get onto the good guy, get in the good guy club, and he said, you know, we kind of look at PPO networks as an ATM machine that we use to extract dollars from employers' plans. And he said this, which I thought was awesome. He said, you know, if we didn't have the ATM machine, we'd probably get charged with theft because it simply sanitizes the overcharge because nobody cares what the charge is. Everybody just cares about what is the discount. Uh, last one I'll show you real quick is that spinal fusion because I wanted to show you uh, that is a spinal fusion um, in, I believe that was actually in Texas as well, uh, $230,000 worth of build charges. The PPO discount was over 60% off the build, down to $143,000. Uh, a a uh, orthopedic hospital in Oklahoma City is actually one of Keith's uh, next door neighbors. Uh, they charged $59,000, all in, all done for the same procedure. 
The interesting thing to me is the cash price there, um, the 59000 that was not negotiated. That was just the price that they voluntarily came up with. The 143000 was negotiated. And by the way, the employer pays an access fee to access the network that does the negotiation for them. But here's the really dirty secret. The PPO network many times will also charge a percentage of the savings they negotiate to the employer. And the employer's happy to pay it. Because without the discount, look what they would have paid. You get the feeling it's just a game. Okay, real quick, um, getting back to, to DPC, you know, breaking referral patterns to the inefficient hospital systems is very important to my employers. Again, they just want happy and healthy employees. The Kempton Group, we, you know, we started our relationship, our journey down uh, the path of free market medicine with Surgery Center of Oklahoma and, and Dr. Keith Smith. Um, but we have been, at, we've been very effective in pouring gasoline on, on what we created. Uh, just at the Kempton Group, and I'm a little old TPA in Oklahoma City, but we actually do business with over, with, I think we're actually now over 52 different free market facilities in eight different states. Um, if you go to our website, premierproviders.com, you can see that we're really thick along the I-35 corridor, uh, and all of the bundled cash pricing that we utilize for our clients, because I am a free market guy, all of that pricing is actually available for free, no login, in the public area on our website, premierproviders.com. And I encourage you all to take a look at those. Very, very soon, we're gonna have a free pricing uh, engine uh, search tool that's gonna be on the Free Market Medical Association's website. And it will be, uh, if you are a member, um, buyer, seller, facilitator, uh, mainly it'll be for buyers, or excuse me, for sellers, they'll be able to post their pricing uh, on the FMMA's website, but the general public will be able to access it for free. So um, some of those facilitators that charge access to free pricing are gonna have a bad day when that happens. <laughs> but being that this is a DPC conference, um, the free market needs you, self-funded employers need you all. Um, we need those DPCs out there that are not only responsible and accountable to their patient, um, you know, that you have no quotas, you have no minimum referrals. Just like me, I work for my client. I really want my, my employers and my employees, um, you know, we really are looking for, uh, to have a doc, a, a, a um, um, general practitioner, family doc that actually works for us as a patient. And it's a hugely important thing. But again, disrupting those referral patterns uh, upstream and working with specialists, um, which I think our next speaker is going to talk more about, and, and some of those um, free market surgery centers is key, and really the tip of the spear for that is the DPC. How can you do it? Give excellent care at a fair price, keeping the patient's best, in, best medical interests in mind, while you also refer to other like-minded, value-oriented providers. Remember that um, cost and quality is important to your patient, and it's also important to their employer. Uh, we've, this is a ridiculous slide. Our, um, at the FMMA conference, one of the other vendors, he put this up here, and actually Keith already gave the story of Jay and Keith, so I'm going to skip over that. Uh, but really, to learn more about what we're trying to do, really, um, this entire story, we have built a, uh, an association around what I've told you all today, and it's called the Free Market Medical Association. FMMA.org. Uh, we actually have the executive director of the FMMA is in the back, um, Megan Friedman, and she came with us. So if anybody has any questions, uh, she will be available. And that's my story. So I'm Brian Hill. I just, I guess, a brief introduction. I'm a practicing urologist. I'm in Atlanta, Georgia probably one of the few specialists that are actually here, although I think we see too many, I saw a urologist around, an ENT and a pediatric and a neurologist over here, so I guess that's our specialty table. Quick, I guess my foot, footprint into this, my foray into this, actually pretty simple and straightforward. I love medicine. You know, I came out of residency excited about practicing medicine. I thought it was a wonderful, noble thing that we get to do every day. 
think it's remarkable that people get to come into our offices, sit down in front of us, have us work with them, and try to find a way to help them better. It's that one place where I think the rest of the world stops and we just get to be able to do really remarkable things in people's lives. I got a little disenchanted coming out though because I realized that there were an awful lot of people in that exam room beside me and my patient. And, and I think that's why everybody is here is that same understanding. So it was that understanding that kind of set us out on, on discussions on a lot of tables and, and uh, panel discussions and talking to employers and going down and talking in DC and, and kind of I think ended up rallying a couple of us to step out and, and try to find a way to, to make a radical difference in this world. And, and I feel very blessed to sit behind people like Lee and, and you know, Josh Ombar who was speaking here earlier who are the real innovators in this space of, of trying to get direct pay care and get that thing that we talk about the industry of healthcare out of our office and out of where it's not supposed to be. So it was out of that that ultimately we spent a lot of time in DC and realized a, a group of us that we were beating our head against the wall and getting very bloodied and not making much difference. And so we've developed a company called Healthcare Impact Partners, Hip Nation, and that, that really has been a foray for us to try to create a platform to put this type of, of move on steroids. What we see here, actually I'll ask before I get into it too far, uh, how many people are actually doing DPC here, direct pay care, primary care? Okay. So, so wonderful, great, right? We're talking about a, a wonderful, tremendous, innovative product in access to healthcare. You know, a wonderful, innovative product as a, as a way to try to get the third-party payer mix out, interact with our patients directly, but it is one small part of that ecosystem. You know, it's the basis, the foundation of that ecosystem, but if we really, truly, and the reason I stand here, want to create a radical change in healthcare, if we want to disrupt this thing called healthcare, then we need to expand it beyond what you guys are doing. We need to actually utilize your foundation to allow us to create this wholesale change in outpatient health care. So second part of that, of course, is specialists. How many specialists are here? I, I saw Michelle, who we went to residency together, so we got a couple specialists in the room as well. Of the specialists that are here, how many are taking cash? Ah, awesome. You don't see a whole lot of people out in that space kind of in, in the direct pay care for, for specialty care. We have a, bit of a different business model. Of the primary care doctors out here in the, doing DPC, how many have reached out to specialists and tried to get direct cash, uh, cash contracting in that space? And how many have been successful? <laughs> right, there's a problem there. And the problem becomes because we've got to find a way to look at the more global perspective. It's what David was speaking about. It's actually what we heard a little bit here through the TPA, through our surgical center. You know, we've got to find a way to expand beyond that, this, this direct pay care movement, which is awesome. Like Hal said, it's the second biggest movement in healthcare in the United States behind employment. But we've got to really put this thing on steroids. So specialists, how do we get specialists on board and engaged and participating with this? It's a little tough. So we'll move through it a little bit. So my why, I'll see if I follow this. I don't know. I, I, I was telling Ori I'm a little ADD, so I have a hard time sitting in one spot too long, and I've been sitting here for an awful lot today already. So we'll try to walk through some of this stuff, and, and I might skip around and move through. Uh, so why? So, of course, why in the world and a specialist do what you're doing? Actually, I'll have to tell you guys, you know, it's envy. I'm a little envious here. I sit here as a, as a, as a specialist. I remember going through residency, kind of going... Great, I get to operate on guys, I get to, to cut the cure, it's a great place to be. And, and now I sit back and, and go, man, I'm really envious that, that I don't have what you all have, where you can step into this space of, of, of direct pay and directly contract with your patients. So, so we're very envious, but the, the, the third party mayor, payer model's broken, right? I don't think there's much doubt from any of us that this is a terrible healthcare delivery model. Costs are rising, they're going up too dang quickly. We're passing along more and more costs to our employees. It's kind of what David was saying. We've got this wonderful high deductible product out there. I love HSAs and high deductible health plans, but it's a costly healthcare system that they're reaching into. We've got to find a way to disrupt that. So care is becoming, as a result of increased cost sharing and a high cost healthcare system becoming inaccessible for too many people. You know, we, we love our patients. We love healthcare. We've got to find a way to fix this system. You know, the model, of course, as you all know, promotes billing over patient health, and we are buried under this wonderful avalanche of administration and bureaucracy. I think, you know, Lee, you had that wonderful slide. From 1970, you'll see the 3,300% growth in administration in healthcare, you know, where we've seen about a 50% growth in the number of physicians in healthcare. There's something really out of whack with that model. You know, if you actually look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics, behind every physician, there's $862,000 in labor costs 
that's 16 people that are working behind you to allow you to go take care of a patient. And we know that only about 75% of them are actually actively involved in patient care. The rest are administrative bureaucracy. There's a lot of cost within that that make healthcare unaccessible and make it very burdensome for people as physicians. What's the big you know, thing running through healthcare right now is physician burnout. You know, it was on the front page of Urology Times. You know, my wonderful urology magazine was physician burnout. You know, it's being talked about. We have the MAG Medical Association of Georgia, House of Delegates meeting this weekend that's going on. They're talking about physician burnout. Why are we burnout? out? We get to do the best job in the world. We get to help people. And yet we're dying under the burden of this thing called healthcare. And as a result of all of this, our patient health is declining. Something's wrong, so we've got to fix it. So that downside, we were actually at a meeting and I was talking to one of the primary care physicians and we were talking about moving into, you know, trying to help assist with my, our Hip Health Nation uh, direct pay care. And she said, you know what, Brian, every year I think it's has gotten as bad as it can get and next year it's worse. And, and that's where we're going. So, so we need to interrupt and disrupt this. And, and again, thank God for you all that you are. So specialists, why should we move into this space? Well, just the same reason that, that everybody in the primary care space has, you know, less administrative bureaucracy, less cost, you know, cash on the service side, so it actually gets the present value of, you know, of, of cash. I hate the word reimbursement. That means I'm getting paid for something later that I did. I'm actually expending something and then getting reimbursed back instead of paid for a service that I deliver. There's a rapidly growing market that's out here that we can talk about that will hit a little bit within the TPA space. But most importantly, the bottom is, Boy, medicine is supposed to be joyful. It's supposed to be great what we get to do every day. So, so primary, I mean, for so specialists, certainly a big drive, a desire to move into this space. For DPC, you know, why is it important for you to try to do what some of you have done when you've raised your hands and trying to engage specialists within this? Well, because this is a value proposition for your patients. And like Josh was saying earlier, that part of what brings you, you know, more patience, what part of what brings you value to your patients is, is trying to find a way to get them access to low cost, high quality health care. So we should be finding a way to reach out into this spatial, uh, space of specialists to improve their access to care and decrease the cost of care. And, and we'll talk about how it can potentially increase the ability to scale. We had a conversation earlier about marketing, you know, and, and how can marketing kind of play in? Well, the scale will help certainly. So, so where's the fertile ground out here? And, and this was kind of going a little bit, I think, before with some of the marketing talk, is that right now, this is really a missionary selling point for a lot of people in DPC. You know, they're kind of reaching out and trying to find the uninsured, the underinsured. We talked about some of the, the medical sharing entities that are out there. They've doubled in the past five years. You know, I think we have about 560 to 600,000 people in the medical sharing communities. So fertile ground for, people, you know, for you all to step into. But a lot of it is still in this kind of missionary selling that either I'm going to try to convert my practice or I'm going to go give talks or I'm going to talk at church or I'm going to talk at, at the grocery store. I'm going to try to get people to come to me. That's missionary selling. And it's a very difficult thing to try to perhaps make a great movement to radically transform DPC by doing it on, on a person by person, person basis. So where's the greater scale potential? Employers. You know, and this is a space where we can find specialists can start working with the DPC physicians to really kind of help us create scale. So, you know, again, Jay was just talking about the self-funded based plans, but the great scale right now is in this small employer space. It's the low-hanging fruit. You know, someone asked before about why we're not moving right into Medicare. Well, eventually Medicare will come, but every place of innovative disruption starts where there's a great need. You know, and there's a great need in the small business space because they're dying under rising premiums. And so as a result of some of that, they're moving towards, you know, this movement towards, uh, well, we'll scoot down, to cost sharing. They're doing greater, you know, shifting of costs onto the individual patients where we've seen high deductible health plans increasing from four to 29% over the past decade. You know, we see the premiums go, that are going up per employee right now are about $6,000 with 1,000, you know, paid directly by the employee. With the average in the small business space, deductible of about $2,100. What I see within that space is opportunity. Opportunity for us to step in, you know, and actually be able to, be able to provide a low cost, high quality product. And so the biggest move in self-funding, and this is where I think, again, we're gonna not need to find people like Jay to, to work with us, is in this, you know, small business space. From 25 to 99, and then from, 100, from 99 to, to 1,000 employees, that's the biggest move towards self-funding. And so that is a big space for us to be able to reach into and bring a quality product to, but again, we have to find an intermediary to make that happen, which can be people like Jay through the TPAs. 
So specialty care, and I'll, I'll this, the, the average uh, uh, you know, in-network uh, co-payment is about $38, co-insurance is about $19. Uh, for that's for seeing a specialist. I'll tie back into a little bit later what that means and how we can actually, as specialists, move into the direct pay space. So, the realities. Why aren't most specialists doing this? Well, you guys probably know plenty of us. We're still pretty well paid. You know, we're not hurting that bad yet. Most of us are getting burned out. We're getting tired. We're running around like chickens with our head cut off. But we just haven't gotten to that point where we're miserable. And so that's kind of inhibiting some of the movement into the specialty, you know, specialists moving on. And most importantly, though, is we're a different business model. You know, we're not based on necessarily following a large cohort of patients, I mean, a small cohort of patients. We need a large patient base in order to feed. You know, and so I can't have a, a panel of 600 patients that, that can actively take care. I need a, pa a patient population of about 10,000 in order to support, you know, a practice. You know, and so it's a very different business model, you know, to bring that on board. And we've got some surgical specialties that, you know, uh, procedures that create some high cost. And so our business model, as opposed to our primary care model, is different. And so it's a little bit more difficult in that space for us to kind of step into doing a, a direct payer care contracting. So we're really a value-added process, where somebody sends me a patient, they have an acute illness, I find a way to step into their lives, make them better. You know, that, that's a very different business model. And that business model works much better in a fee-for-service environment. But we can do that fee-for-service environment, just like we talk about with the Surgical Center of Oklahoma, at a cash-based price just a transparent cash base price. So initially, I think most specialists uh, are moving into this kind of a hybrid approach in, health, in, in, in DPC. So the hybrid approach is, well, actually we'll do this. So we'll move into DPC, straight DPC. And, and actually, of those people that raise their hand taking cash in the specialty, are any of you pure DPC? Don't, no insurance, no nothing? So a couple are, which is great. Are you chronic care patients, I mean, GI, cardiology, or are you surgical specialist? Surgical specialist? Any surgical specialist? Got a couple surgical specialists. No, see, okay. So there are very few of us moving into DPC space. There's a Freedom Orthopedics in Atlanta that's a, an orthopedic surgeon that's moved into doing pure direct pay care contracting, but that's not very common. And some of these physicians will hook in with a surgical center and actually say, all right, we'll go to uh, multiple employers and say, I'll do your knees at a, a fixed cash base rate and, and do some direct contracting in that space, you know, just to try to move into that. The big move, though, again, that's still in my, in my perspective missionary. You know, if we want to create a radical change in healthcare, then this needs to be a joint effort. It's going to be something where we have to bring together the direct pay care of primary care physicians and work in as a joint effort with a specialist in order to have the DPC primary care create that foundation, you know, that referral-based foundation. And so of the, the DPC physicians, and this is a difficult thing, and we were talking about this a little bit before, if some of you are consolidated in certain areas, in certain markets, get together. You know, talk with each other. Find certain surgical specialists that you actually say, we're consent, you know, happy to refer to this person. This is a person that we think does great work, at a, at, you know, does quality work and that our patients enjoy. Get together and then actually try to start funneling your patients to their, that person by creating a direct contract with them. If you can sit down and say, I've got five, six, eight dry, you know, primary care physicians that I'm willing to set and refer to you for a, a direct pay care rate, it makes it much easier for us to step into that space and say, yep, I'm willing to kind of set that, that cash base uh, price out there. So consolidating the physician base is one way certainly to do that. The other way to do that you know, is to try to create a, a DPC network almost, if you will. And, and that is by actually trying to get multiple direct pay care physicians together, sit down and consolidate and talk with a, a, a TPA, work into the small business space, you know, and try to create a whole network based around direct pay care contracting. So really try to put things at, at a larger scale. So a couple things that, that pop up and, and, and are worried from, you know, that worry physicians and, and specialists in the kind of hybrid-based model. I'm gonna keep my foot in my insurance world, I'm gonna keep my foot in the, you know, and, and try to also participate in some of this direct pay care contracting. The charge master, and, and I'm sure some of you guys have heard this, you know, the charge master is our fee schedule. What's our baseline fee schedule? You know, you should have one fee schedule. Everybody worries that if I have a cash base rate, you know, then, and then I've got a separate rate for my insurance and I've got a separate rate for Medicare, you know, then my cash base rate's gonna become my fee schedule. So what you have to do is maintain one single fee schedule. So everybody gets shown the single price. And then off of that fee schedule, you can accept discounts. 
So I can accept cash-based discounts off of my fee schedule where I set myself at 136% Medicare, but for my cash-based payments, I'm willing to accept 100% Medicare because of that, law, you know, that decrease in, in administrative bureaucracy that has to go through that whole coding and billing process. And so self, we can create that discounts for self-pay based patients. Where this was actually shown that we could do this, you know, how, where was this you know, uh, allowable? So Medicare. Within Medicare, the usual and customary fees, what they base our fee schedule bound, we also talk about most favored nation clause within Medicare, is that Medicare has to get our lowest fee. The OIG came out in, in 2007, and they said that we can exclude cash-based payments from uninsured or underinsured patients and not have them impact our fee schedule. So it is actually okay for us to do this. So this has always been a big bugaboo within the specialty space of going, but I can't have two separate fees. Well, you're not. You have a usual and customary fee, but discounted for the uninsured, underinsured paying cash. So this was actually in Wisconsin stable and, and set out to be doing that. And they said that we don't have to change our, our usual charges as a result of cash-based payments. Medicare, not that this is gonna happen very often, but actually has the Medicare beneficiaries have a right of refusal. They can actually sign a form, in this, and there are certain requirements that I put on the bottom there, that allows them to say, hey, I'm gonna pay you cash directly you know, for the service that you provide, as long as you have them fi you know, filling out and signing a paper saying that they understand that everything listed at the bottom there, and they can pay you cash without this impacting your Medicare contracts. So everybody worries about this interrupting Medicare, so you're okay within this space as long as the Medicare beneficiary is aware of the, follow the things that are listed below. So Medicare gives us the freedom to be able to do this, and so that allows us to then apply that same thing into the commercial market. A couple things that are a little different, though, is that commercial market is by state, and, and this is where I always tell people you need to take a look at a state-by-state -state process on this, but 18 states you know, have, have a, a most favored nation clause exclusion. You know, that the states that I listed below have clauses that do not allow an insurance company to step up and say, I'm going to make you fix your price, me, at the lowest price, that you can't charge Cigna or anybody else lower than me. So, so there's not a most favored nation clause status for the commercial market in, in these 18 states. There's pending in two other states. And there's also some, some you know, regulation that does not allow in those, in those 10 states that I listed below that you don't have to disclose your, your contracts with, uh, with other insurance companies. All right, well, we'll go avoid it. So a couple things. So avoidance of claim submissions, and actually the one on the bottom is this. The, so some of the things that people are saying in this space of, of, of specialists asking for and saying if I can get, you know, get a, a cash-based contract, one thing people talk about is just act like the person doesn't have insurance. Just tell the person, don't let me know you have insurance. That's a little slippery slope to step into. But one thing that HIPAA has allowed us to do in the ruling from September 2013 is that the, there's a right to restrict disclosure that if a patient comes into your office and you say, I'm, I don't want you to code or bill my insurance company, I'm willing to take a cash-based rate, there's some paperwork that they have to fill out for a right of disclosure document, and you can do it, set up a cash-based contract with that individual you know, for that service that you provided. No matter what the insurance, you know, no matter what insurance they have, this is a right of, of, of refusal for that patient to give their information to the insurance company. So, so that is a right that was cleared in 2013, and Utilizing that, you can actually use HSA money you know, for that transaction with the uh, specialists. Uh, so there is, a, there is an avoidance of claim submission process that was uh, put forward by HIPAA that allows us to do this. Uh, the problem is that, of course, does not apply to the deductible, so that, that doesn't include into that space. Now, everything I listed there, of course, always the caveat, you know, I'm not a lawyer, so, so ask a lawyer, uh, and, you know, because every state is, is certainly different in and among itself. The, one thing I'll talk about is what we're doing, and, and, uh, and there is so much that's going on out here in this space and of, of trying to transform healthcare, and there's a lot of bubbling up here in, in healthcare. Uh, the you know, delivery model disruption and innovation, I think, is, is really, you know, like David Goldhill said, really probably the most it's been since pre-Medicare, you know, Medicaid days. And so one of the things that we're looking at trying to do here within this is look at the ecosystem. You know, like I said, right now we're so busy, I think, within the DPC space and, and within the specialty space of kind of looking at the world that we're within, you know, but we're not stepping out and looking at the entirety of the ecosystem around us, that how do we take and radically transform and take the insurance piece and step that into the, put that into the right space? Who is in the insurance space that we can tie into with and work with, work with a TPA and, and do direct contracting via a TPA to the employer to allow us to actually do direct contracting with the employer and exclude the insurer out of that and put them into a high deductible space. 
we can utilize that same model to bring specialists on board, you know, and do cash-based pricing for specialists on board. And by doing that, you know, it allows us to create a tremendous value proposition for, you know, the employee, the employers, you know, and, and hopefully us as well. So basically, we have to look at altering not just small little parts of this healthcare system, but we have to look at the interdependent parts to, to interact with each of these parts to try to bring them forward in order to make a radical healthcare system change. And I am very excited and actually very hopeful about where we are moving in healthcare because like I said, this is, uh, I truly believe, the, the beginning of where we're moving, that we are on that early hockey stick of this innovator's curve, and it's not going to be too far along here where we get enough pressure, enough threshold behind us you know, that this really rapidly begins to gain steam, but the steam's really gonna come when we move beyond just the direct pay primary care space and try to find ways to take DPC to employers and then take that into the full ecosystem of healthcare, which includes specialists. So, so thank you, I look forward to answering questions and, and certainly we can talk a lot more about how we can bring specialists on board. Thank you. So we do have time for, for some questions, uh, so you can go ahead and step up to the microphone, but while we're waiting for that, I'm just going to ask a few questions myself. Brian, is it of, of your opinion uh, that specialists can actually charge less than Medicare? So actually, yes, you can. So, uh, so actually, Medicare and the OIG, if you look through the Federal Register, which uh, someone's talking about, uh, you know, looking through the, the tax code, one of our prior speakers was talking about reading through the tax code, read the Federal Register, then you're really into something. Uh, so within the Federal Register, they, the Medicare allows you to charge less than Medicare for a fee, as long as you can take into account that there's going to be a differential in administrative costs that you're subtracting out of the fee you're charging Medicare, a Medicare recipient, or anybody even outside of Medicare. So yes, you can. So that's, so when I'm talking with specialists, that's probably one of the most common things that I get is that we cannot undercut Medicare. And so, uh, you know, that's, I, I, I do believe that's, you know, false. It is, and, and, and even the last OIG statement mentioned that as well. I, I have a couple more questions, then I'm gonna open up. We are actually running ahead of schedule, um, so uh, I don't plan on using all the time. I know everyone wants a break. Um, so the Surgery Center of Oklahoma is, obviously makes, makes ripples uh, quite a long way away from Oklahoma. Uh, I was in Nashville last week and got a phone call from my office manager who told me that we just got a phone call from the local hospital and asked if we had ever heard of the Surgery Center of Oklahoma and wanted to know if they could offer us cash price bundled pricing for surgeries. Uh, so we have a meeting uh, set up with the hospital when we get back, uh, back from here on Monday. So uh, Keith, if you could say if there's one thing that really limits something like surgery centers of Oklahoma from popping up and, and, and creating competition all across the country. Is there one thing that you could say really limits that? Yeah, the, the one thing that sticks out bigger than anything are certificate of need laws. Uh, and the, you think about the Austrian economist Murray Rothbard said, if you ever want to understand something in economics or government or politics, just start with cui bono, who benefits. So you think who benefits from a lack of competition in healthcare facilities? Well, it's the crony cartel that exists. So there's still states that have certificate of need laws. These were birthed uh, by bribes paid in Washington, D.C. Uh, to the Fed's credit, they backed off, but certain states like Georgia still have them. Uh, but certificate of need laws, absolutely. The second thing that stands in the way is really a lack of perception of the demand that's out there uh, by the buyers of healthcare and the, and the physicians um, really mistakenly bringing the risk adversity that they appropriately provide in patient care to the business operations of their practice. I think the, the lack of entrepreneurialism, basically that that's the core and that's the source of it is that we all tend to bring our, the same risk adversity that we bring to patient care into our practices in management of the businesses of our practices. So you asked for one thing and I gave you two. <laughs> that sounds like a hedge. Uh, the, uh, so just for the record, there are 35 states that still have certificate of need laws. There are pressure in many states to overturn those. Uh, there's nothing in the free market where you have to ask your competition if you're allowed to compete with them, but that's what we're asking in certificate of need. Uh, so it's stifling competition, which keeps prices high. Jay, if I'm a if I'm a direct primary care doctor setting up a practice, and I get a company that hears about me, and they have 25 employees, and they say, "Boy, we'd love to contract with you for our 25 employees," and I'm in Pennsylvania, and I want to find a guy like you, what would you say would be the 
best next step? Yeah, that's that is a challenge right now, Lee. Because I I I do I get I get those phone calls as you know, hey Jay, you're you're in Oklahoma, but I'm in Ohio. Um, where's your counterpart in Ohio? Um, and actually, um, Sunday I'm I'm flying to Minneapolis to a convention of my peers, and I am I'm going to be speaking on this very subject. That you know, if you are an independent third party administrator, in other words, you do not have some sort of contractual shackle on you. Uh, that would prohibit you from doing business with either a surgery center of Oklahoma or a DPC practice, you need to make yourselves known uh, to the public and we'll see whether we can get that on the uh, FMMA website. Great. Microphone over here. I'm Judy Thompson. I'm a general surgeon from New Braunfels, Texas, outside of San Antonio, and uh, the bulk of what I do is breast cancer work. So as a specialist, um, I believe that most of my patients need their third-party payer. They need multimodality treatment. They come in talking about, I know I'm going to meet my deductible and so on and so forth. So I believe that as their health care provider, you know, these people need their third-party payers and I need to be able to participate with them to some degree. So if you would comment on whether that's a rational thought or not. Um, I also do have a cash pay um, service and uh, my fees are very much along the lines of what Dr. Smith just said. And uh, the people who pay cash are, are very grateful and express that they find that the fees are reasonable. The other thing that I think ties me down is uh, being part of a PHO in a small community that has been pretty effective at um, resisting encroachment. Um, we're in the corridor between Austin and San Antonio. We're one of the fastest growing areas in the country. Um, so our PHO negotiates with local employers and some narrow networks have developed and as a participant in those networks I find myself at times with um, increasingly diminished access to patients. So um, those are a couple of the things that make me feel like I need to stay in the mainstream and participating with third party payers whereas if I were left to my own devices I would love to get out. So I look forward to your comments. Thank you. So uh, I'll, guess I'll, I'll kick off on the, the needing the catastrophic coverage and, and keeping your foot in both worlds. So it's a bit, a base, bit of a hybrid-based model. One of the, again, it's going to be an ecosystem change. And, and if we really, truly want to be able to free the specialist up to participate in this type of model, to try to find a way to radically decrease costs, you know, then the way we could certainly do that, and it's going to be slow. That's why I think you know, specialists are going to need a hybrid-based model with a foot in both worlds. But if we could get together with, with self-funded based businesses, allow them to self-fund, right, it's creating an insurance product within the self-funded based businesses that works synergistically with what we're trying to do. And so that is where I think we need to sit down and talk with people like, like Jay in the TPA space, or we try to find you know, these businesses near, near us to allow them to self-fund create an insurance-based product that works in conjunction with what it is that you're trying to do for the catastrophic high cost if somebody needs to have a XRT for, for breast cancer, but allows you in the outpatient space of doing a breast biopsy for $85 instead of $19,000. Yeah, so it's going to have to be just not one little thing at a time that's going to have to happen. There's a couple dominoes that are going to have to fall. And there's a lot of, of movement going on right now you know, in this space to try to allow that to happen. And so it's just, it's not gonna happen unfortunately overnight. So that's why I think we've been very slow as specialists to be able to step into this. It's gonna take some time for all of those little different things to align to be able to make it happen well. Uh, so we're, we have a group that we're trying to work on on allowing us to be able to do that. And, and fortunately we've been very blessed to have a, a great, some great TPAs and people in our space that we've been working with to try to help create the insurance product to help support you know, direct contracting with specialists because it's gonna save money. Yeah, I was going to add a few things on that as well. Um, you know, what we do with uh, with cash uh, payment to surgery centers and, and specialists, um, it's actually part of the benefit design of of the of the benefit plan. In other words, we have um, you know a typical plan is if you use an in network provider, it's eighty twenty. Well, if one of my patients utilizes a surgery center of Oklahoma, it's paid at one hundred percent. So it's not, I mean, that's actually part of the benefit plan. We just waive the deductible copay and coinsurance. Um, but I mean, our ultimate model 
is that a free market provider, whether it's a specialist surgery center, hospital, et cetera, um, if we have a bundled cash price up front that we're able to evaluate and say, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very, very fair price. Uh, the nature of the bundle, what, it's inclu what is included is, is, uh, is a good value for the employer. Then we just want to get in a mode where we're just paying that at 100. percent I mean, the employer does not have to. If they get a good enough deal, they don't have to collect a copay or a deductible or, or anything like that from the patient. Um, so that would be kind of the primary benefit design is bundled upfront cash payment, and then the fallback for us is to eventually just do away with the networks and where the the benefit plan actually says, you know, uh, for you know, for care that's difficult to bundle, our standard reimbursement is 150% of Medicare, uh, or that can be negotiated up or down, but it, but it is not, um, I think it's important when you're look, talking about self-funded employer, um, the TPA, if they're in a pure role, it's never, it's not their money. And so it's always up to the budget of the employer as to how, uh, you know, how lucrative or, or how uh, conservative their reimbursement uh, would be. And one of the things that I wanted to, to clarify is with all the talk about self-funded plans, you know, self-funded plans basically play by a different set of rules than the ACA plans, which is why you're seeing such a large expansion uh, in the self-funded market. It, again, it's a completely different set of rules than, than typical ACA-compliant plans, which is why they can be cheaper products. Is that... Still, still have to be compliant, but the compliance level is a little different. So still have to be compliant, but the compliant levels are, are different. Hey, just oh, I'm one sorry. second. You're... Your question, I want to come back to because it, there's deep in your question is really the reason we're here. And our message is there is so much business out there that in the short term, while you may think I've got to keep my toe in this space and be in a hybrid model, that's really how everybody starts. I would agree. But think about this. The state of Oklahoma has 182,000 employees in their self-funded plan, and they are now directly contracted with the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, all out-of-pocket waived for anyone who elects to come to my facility. So the physicians and surgeons, the specialists who work at the Surgery Center of Oklahoma now have a population of 182,000 cash payers. So. That's just an example. That's the tip of the iceberg. That's what's out there. And as, as Texas watches Oklahoma save $200 million, which is the conservative estimate for savings the first year this program is implemented, as Texas watches that, they're not going to be able to sit back and watch Oklahoma be smarter. So, <laughs> I mean... That's an example of, you know, wow, maybe I don't have to maintain a hybrid model. Maybe as a specialist, you know, a urologist needs a, you know, a population of 10,000 to survive. There are 62 surgeons at my facility, and they're all looking forward to really abandoning a hybrid model and having a full-on model where nobody has to deal with any insurance ever again. And it's there, and it's just waiting for everybody in this room to grab. So there's kind of the short and long-term view of that, and I wanted to make those comments because that's why we're here, I think, really, to let you know what is out there. I mean, what's out it there to be, be and yeah, it could be done. Right. I mean, we've done it, and you can do it. Thank you. And that's that exciting vision out there. I mean, that, that's what excites me about this, is trying to find a way to, to get to that end game of, of how do we really create a, an open, competitive, free market, cash-based, transparent environment in healthcare. We'll get there. But it's going to take some starts and stops, and it's going to take people like the Surgical Center of Oklahoma. It's going to take people like Jay. It's going to take people like you all and, and all of us, like Josh said earlier, stealing from each other, robbing from each other, learning from each other, and, and continuing to try to find a way to, to bring this ultimate thing forward because we've got a lot of stakeholders that we're working against in order to get there. I know people are getting a little bit, a little bit antsy. I see we've got about five questions there, so if we could keep it, try to keep it to one question each and, and keep our answers down, and we, we can... People will hang around here afterwards and answer lots of questions. So the mic over here. Venu Jilapali, I'm a gastroenterologist in Houston. And, uh, you know, you were talking about having specialists on board. I'm third-party free as of April 1st. So I'm looking at it from my side. I'm already on board. And I, I want Texas to be better than Oklahoma, right? So, <laughs> so, so I... <laughs> 
Megan, get that guy's name. <laughs> so, you know, I've started a network with direct primary care providers in Houston, and some, some of whom are here. For a guy like me, who's a specialist, who already has skin in the game, I'm on board, I'm in. What, are, what would you recommend or actionable next steps for a guy like me to take to make that ecosystem reality in, in my town? So uh, you need to find like-minded people. So you, you're, you're a GI doctor. Now where's your urologist? Where's your neurologist, nephrologist? You know, where are your other compatriots that you can bring together with the same base that you've already established with the direct pay care network around you and actually create almost, if you will, you know, a true full direct pay care network. And then now you've got a, a tremendous product, a healthcare product that you can bring forward that's cheaper, higher quality, more accessible, greater touch, innovative, right? You're not coding, billing. Now you can actually actually use you know, this wonderful computer technology that we have called our cell phone and, and start utilizing that in the space of, of healthcare management. You do that, and now you've got a tremendous product that you can step forward to, to these businesses and, and do what Surgical Center of Oklahoma has done. You can reach out to, to Jay or his people and say, okay, let's, how do we knock down a 300, 500, 1,000 man business and step into them and actually be able to contract with them directly you know, that's where you start creating that economy of scale, and that's really where you grow, not by missionary selling, but by great scale. And you join the Free Market Medical Association, oh, yes. which is the match.com of healthcare, where <laughs> it is. I mean, that's what we had in mind, was helping buyers and sellers find each other and not have all the brokers and the just the trolls in the room that are fogging up the exchange. So that that's really the purpose of FMMA, is to make sure you are found by the people who are looking for you. And interestingly, I help people find my competitors in all over the United States so they don't, patients don't have to actually travel to come see me. And that's kind of the spirit of the organization. That, that's, that's the other recommendation I have. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Nirav Patel. I'm from California. I'm a family practice physician. So I had a question regarding those, uh, I think it was the ASOs or the TPAs that are run by Blue Cross and United. Uh, why is it that to most employers go to them? Is it just inertia or what, what's, the, what's the rationale for that? Because they make it very, very lucrative to the brokers and consultants, to the awesome. sales guys. I got you. So it's a sales job. It's not the employer going to it. Profit no, deal. <laughs> no. Oh, it's, okay. uh, the, the, no. It's a whole other discussion. Um, but... <laughs> If you want to take, talk about trolls and, and, and the previous speaker talking about incentives, whew, there are some stiff incentives out there um, that it really put the employers kind of in the dark. Hi, I'm Katrina Iqbal. I'm family medicine, and I have a DPC practice since February 2015 in Austin, Texas. And I had a question about referring out to specialists in my area. I've networked with different specialists. I kind of know who the good people are. I did my training in Austin. Um, but I've had some issues with patients that have HMO plans that are interested in using that. I obviously don't accept that. Uh, for example, I saw a kid. Uh, he had a foreign body in his ear. I couldn't get it out. I called the ENT, got him an appointment the next day, told them that they have an HMO, but they're willing to pay cash. And I asked if there's anything I can do for the referral process. They said, no problem, just come see him. Um, in the morning, they came in the morning and the patient couldn't be seen because they're like, well, we, you can't pay cash because you have an HMO and we have an agreement with your HMO plan. And then they couldn't um, use their insurance because I'm not contracted with the, their HMO and I'm not their PCP through HMO. So do you have any advice on how to manage those kind of patients? <laughs> Yeah, that How about take tech. that out of that kid's ear and don't do anything and don't charge anybody? I mean, how that takes no supplies, no time. Yeah. Give me a break. Well, that, that's. <laughs> <laughs> but or, or don't sign up with that HMO in the first place. I mean, we're out of network with everybody, so I don't have any contractual obligations, and that really takes the shackles off. But how about take care of the kiddo and then right. forget but, it? But your patient, you know, so your patient has the insurance, and they're, they're paying you basically cash, so they still have the insurance, and you still have to deal with the problem. And so now you have a patient that needs something done but can't get care. Now, you showed the, the information yeah. on the High Tech Act, 
right. of 2013 that basically a patient doesn't have to use their insurance. They can so they have a right of refusal. So they can have a right of refusal for that employer to actually build their insurance. They just have to sign some, there's a form that you can go on, pull up, they have to sign a right of refusal, and then that employer can charge cash for that. And that can still come out of an HSA account. It just can't go against the deductible. Okay, so any deductible. specialist can, um, my patients can print that form out, go to any specialist, choose to pay cash, and not have to go through their HMO. Yep. Yes, yes a, but some a, education needs to happen. 2003, HIPAA high tech, yep. Okay. Yeah, some Great. education, because they will, they will turn them away probably nine times out of ten or, or more than that. But the reality of it is the High Tech Act clearly opens it up. You do not have to use your insurance benefits. And where would I find that form? <laughs> High Tech 23, HIT 2013. Yeah, 2013. I, could, I was going to put the, the website on my thing, and I didn't. But, yeah, if you, if you look up High, uh, high Tech and, and uh, right of refusal or even privacy, and it'll have a uh, – uh, and I can even get you the Great. Uh, site for it. Thank you. All right, last question. Hi there, Meg Edison. I'm a pediatrician in Grand Rapids, Michigan. You kind of touched on this earlier. We, um, I, my question is, a lot of our state governments and our local um, governments are having budgetary issues also. And so if you, I, I have a, I'm looking for the sense of how they are insured. And it sounds like you've kind of cracked into that a little bit. But how, um, especially in some of our rural areas, our, our, you know, our schools and our you know, local municipalities, those are going to be our largest employers to a certain sense. So how do you crack into that? Well, the first, first thing that happened for us in the public sector was the largest county in Oklahoma, Oklahoma County, came to us and said, for our 1,300 employees, will you extend this pricing? And I thought, yeah, we'll try it. It's government, but we'll try it. And it actually worked beautifully. And they saved um, about $3 million the first year, uh, three quarters of a million dollars of which was out-of-pocket savings to the not so highly compensated employees of Oklahoma County. Um, that was the first time in December, which is our busiest month typically, that patients told me, and we hear this all the time, we're gonna have Christmas this year because we didn't have to come up with our deductible and copay for my child's tonsillectomy or whatever. So they had, a, they had a wonderful savings and then that data was public and available to municipalities and ultimately to the state of Oklahoma. So there were some very enterprising fellows at an outfit called the Oklahoma Council of Public Affairs that know better than just about anybody I know how to rub salt in a wound. So Oklahoma with the, in Texas too, I know, I mean, they're budget issues because of the oil business. So they took this idea, the salt, and rubbed it in their budget wounds. And the next thing we know, you know, there's legislation flying around to make sure that this happens. So uh, it's very disruptive. All of the states, uh, and I'm in contact with people from Michigan, all of the states are, the eyes of the state self-funded health plans are on what's going on in Oklahoma and watching. And the savings is just gonna be shocking. It's, it's gonna be outrageous, very disruptive. The other thing that I would mention is, is at least in Oklahoma City, we, we are blessed with, we've had a, we do have a, a handful of local media personalities that are really big time into what we're trying to do here. And we've gotten some very favorable um, TV coverage, print coverage uh, of, of just some of these wins out there. And uh, it's really kind of created a buzz. And then again, um, uh, this Think Tank, Oklahoma Council for Public Affairs was very, they, they took those spears and knew where to throw them. So basically it sounds like all the things, it wasn't like the state. There was the no decision. easy button. It started out small no and then they, you did it right and then the state listened. Right. Excellent. Well, I thank the, the panel uh, for volunteering. Jake, Keith, Brian, you guys are fantastic. Um, thank you.